Chapter 9. Collectors of the 16th Century Collectors of the 16th Century Character of the time and the artist's attitude towards the antique Cellini restores antique statues New Roman masterpiece discovered in Rome Decadence of art A protest of Raphael against daily destruction of Roman relics First laws prohibiting exportation of Roman finds Barbaric attitudes of a Barberini First law against the exportation of painting masterpieces As we have already observed, centuries in art cannot be separated like horses into stable boxes there are periods between one change and another, transitional times that make it impossible to fix any date whatsoever. Thus we may say, without stating a date, that the 16th century not only felt the benefit of the Quattrocento for a certain time, but was itself actually Quattrocento for a score of years or more. The men of the past had not vanished. Riccio, for instance, one of the most active imitators of the antique, died in 1533. But when the 16th century began to outline its own character, the cult of art, art patronage, and the passion for collecting fine things are seen to have taken another turn. The Cinquecento has of course magnificent patrons of art, and almost every prince collects something or other. Life is still imbued with partiality for the antique. Lorenzino Medici, in playing Brutus and actually killing his cousin, Duke Alexander Medici, is reconstructing an old heroic attitude in his learned pagan mind. Filippo Strozzi, or whoever planned his suicide, makes one think of some hero of Plutarch when he is found dead, apparently by his own hand, with a line of Virgil, Exuriare oliquis nostris ex ossibus ultor may an avenger arise from my bones written in his own blood at his side painting still deals with subjects from roman history and so does sculpture but artists have lost all comprehension of them a fact still more evident with regard to biblical subjects in support of this statement it is sufficient to quote the painting of paolo veronese now in the academy at venice representing jesus in the house of levi one of the artist's masterpieces in which Christ is in the company of Venetian gentlemen of the 16th century. But if in this painting disregard for the oriental side of the scene is carried to an extreme, it must be said that Titian and Tintoretto, and a great many other painters of the time, were no better. This trait, which certainly originated in the good period of the Renaissance, and which we now find in its full development, indicates that in its most significant and ripest expression, the Cinquecento is the logical decline of a past triumph in art, the victim, as it were, of tradition, of tradition and a few artistic personalities, such as Raphael and Michelangelo, who turned a new leaf in art, awakened a new feeling, a new overpowering school. Michelangelo, especially, with his fascinating and inimitable style, draws a legion of followers, fostering an art that during the great sculptor's life already is ripe for decadence. Enlightened collectors abound in this period, their collections increase daily, but are they really lovers of art as their predecessors were? Are they worshippers of the antique like the bygone collectors? This is what we ask. In the 16th century, when art is a tradition of the far past on the one hand, and on the other almost a tradition of the recent past, life seems to have taken the self-same attitude. People are not real lovers of art, but are so merely by tradition. Every well-bred gentleman of the Cinquecento was obliged to have the air of understanding art. Machiavelli might have added an interesting chapter to his Principe to demonstrate how important it was for a prince to be interested in art, even though, perchance, utterly indifferent to it in reality. When giving instructions to his cortegiano as to what a gentleman of his time ought to know, Castiglione adds that he must learn to paint, even if this art affords you no pleasure, advises Castiglione. It will give you a better understanding of things and a clearer appreciation of the excellency of ancient and modern statues, vases, monuments, medals, cameos, carvings, and other such objects. In a word, ably or otherwise, with natural disposition or not, it was part of good breeding for a gentleman of the 16th century to be interested in art and play the connoisseur. It is from this that the Cinquecento suffers. 
the patent prince patron of art the stock gentleman collector abounds the genuine lover of art is rare a prince's house or that of a simple person of good standing was considered incomplete if without a collection of some sort yet while the artists of the sixteenth century had certainly derived no small benefit from their predecessors passion for the antique they had become far too individual far too engrossed in their own art to be susceptible to the art of the past michelangelo the artist who lived practically through both centuries the sculptor whose genius tremendous and over individual was nevertheless responsible for the decadence of sculpture is a good example of this he can like many other italian artists show his versatility and skill by imitating an art other than his own as he did with the sleeping cupid that deceived cardinal san giorgio but when the artist is genuine and gives his own artistic temperament full play craft and virtuosity disappear reminiscence is impossible even when the subject and peculiar quality of the work suggest imitation and turn thought to the antique michelangelo remains true to his own grand soul his brutus exemplifies the point it was a roman subject of classical times and michelangelo might easily have been infected by the history of the past and the forms he had admired when interested in the excavation of ancient statues in rome yet his brutus is more dante-esque in its tragic lines than roman cellini to illustrate another aspect is a different case he can repair antiquities for his patron cosimo medici fairly well but he also is too highly individual to make an excellent imitation of the antique he tells us that he consented to repair his illustrious patron's ganymede because it was a fine greek work and prone as he is to self-praise he tells how stupendously he can do it but he does not like such work he calls it arte de ciabattini cobbler work the fact however is that he is too much alive to his time has too strong an expression of his own art to be skilful in imitations in fact it happens that he had to try his hand at a portrait of cosimo the first in the guise of a roman emperor the portrait of the grand duke of tuscany will never deceive any art simpleton in spite of its elaborate cuirass fit for augustus cellini is too delightfully cinquecentesque the same may be said of him as a medalist yet in some of cellini's work especially his medals the idea of imitating the romans must have been in his mind and no doubt he was convinced of his success yet he belonged to the group that by their personality influenced others and when trying his hand at imitation quite congenial to his own artistic temperament he makes something that is at least three-quarters cellini these artists nevertheless admire the art of the past though with no danger of infection michelangelo is entranced when the laocoon is discovered in a vineyard near the thermi of titus and goes with his friend sangalo to see that the precious statue be carefully unearthed partly for the sake of gain and partly maybe for the love of art cellini often goes to the roman campagna to see what certain lombard yokels have uncovered in their daily spading of the soil raphael protests in a famous document addressed to leo x against the continual destruction of roman relics his words are worth repeating after declaring that the goths and vandals had not done so much damage to rome as his contemporaries raphael concludes by saying that far too many popes have allowed roman edifices to be ruined simply by permitting the excavation of pozzolana clay from the ground upon which their foundations rest that statues and marble ornaments are daily burned in ovens and turned into mortar that rome in fact the rome of raphael's time is built with naught but mortar made from old statues the sacred marbles of past glories characteristic also is the fact that this country sees the first protective laws against the exportation of antique art this would seem to indicate the consideration in which relics of past art were held in rome judging by the way it was applied however even this act serves to show that there was no more genuine a passion for old and precious antiques in the cinquecento than in the century before the roman laws of the sixteenth century are severe meting out punishment to all and sundry daring to carry the produce of excavations beyond the papal domains but otherwise destruction goes on gaily 
there seems to be no discrimination as to what ought to be saved from the doom of destruction and what is not worth keeping. So while edict after edict is promulgated in order to safeguard the excavation of statues in Rome and elsewhere, edicts are often full of old-fashioned magniloquence. Prohibition concerning the exportation of marble or metal statues, figures, antiquities and such like. The best buildings in Rome were allowed to fall into utter ruin without a protest. The state of things reached the climax of absurdity in the 17th century when Urban VIII of the Barberini family declared the Colosseum a public quarry where the citizens might go for the stones they needed for new constructions an act still commemorated in the protest of all lovers of art with the proverbial pun quod non fecerunt barbari fecerunt barberini what the barbarians did not do the barberini did from this curious inconsistency in the appreciation of art even tuscany the cradle of the renaissance is not immune a medician law intended like the roman one to prevent the exportation of masterpieces and rare works of art makes no mention of precious relics of roman or etruscan origin nor even of the fine pieces of sculpture that were often excavated but considers only the paintings of certain artists of the past school of the renaissance and those of other contemporary artists as being worth keeping so the law declares for the glory and dignity of florence the regulations are given in a second decree along with a list of the names of the artists concerned dead and living their work must not be taken out of tuscany the list is very instructive for it passes over some of the best artists such as botticelli credi the polaiolos and others and prohibits the export of the work of artists that are either unknown to us or are of such mediocrity that it is surprising their work should have been esteemed above the average of their day the following is one of these lists the first that was made one michelangelo Buonarroti, two raffaello da urbino three andrea del sarto four meccarino Five, Il Rosso Fiorentino. Six, Leonardo da Vinci. Seven, Il Franciabigio. Eight, Perino de Vaga. Nine, Jacopo da Puntormo. Ten, Tiziano. Eleven, Francesco Salviati. Twelve, Angelo Bronzino. Thirteen, Daniello da Volterra. Fourteen, Fra Bartolomeo di San Marco della Porta. Fifteen, Fra Bastiano del Pombo. Sixteen, Filippo di Fra Filippo. Seventeen, Antonio da Correggio. Eighteen, Il Parmigianino without insisting upon a comment that might appear paradoxical what kind of collectors of art can be expected from the people who place in the same list of merit leonardo michelangelo titian with cecchin salviati perino del vaga to say nothing of the now forgotten meccarino a painter whose well-deserved oblivion saves us from judging his poor work in another list other names are added they are no less grotesque Santi di Tito Ligozzi, Jacopo de Empoli, etc., in far too good company. End of chapter 9